Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Brianne Bradley. I'm the manager of Major Gifts and Collection Development, previously curatorial assistant in the Contemporary Art Department. Um, I'm part of the curatorial team for Black American Portraits, an exhibition that reframes portraiture to center Black American subjects, sitters, and spaces. The second series of the program, Five Questions for Five Artists, has included conversations between artists in the exhibition, such as Mr. Wash, Elizabeth Columba, Rafa Esparza, and Visa Butler, with LACMA curators and educators. Each of these artists has been presented with the same five questions about their practice and the challenges of representing significant figures and their legacies. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Kim Dakers, whose work, Know My First Name Ain't Baby, is currently included in Black American Portraits. Kim Dakers is a first-generation American sculptor of Jamaican descent who uses found tires and rubber from automobiles and bicycles to create sculptures inspired by people and ideas. The core of Dakers' process involves collecting, wrapping, reassembling, and disassembling tires, eventually treating these materials with spray paint or enamel. Her sculptures are held together using screws and braiding techniques. In this process of material layering, the rubber is transformed into abstract shapes, evoking muscle, bone, skin, and hair. Fascinated by the complexities of varied personalities in her community and the fragments of experience that tend to shape perception, Dakers is committed to an ongoing practice of representing everyday people of color, exploring the paradigm of entitlement to space, honorifics, and monuments. No, My First Name Ain't Baby is inspired by Janet Jackson's classic song and music video, Nasty, from her 1986 album, Control. It represents an unapologetic self-naming in spite of the misogynoir of American social political systems, which managed to simultaneously rely on and overlook Black women's contributions to our society. Dakers received her bachelor's degree from Williams College as a dual major in studio art and political science with a minor in Africana studies. She has a master's degree in education, focusing on teaching English as a second language. She formally began her full-time art practice in 2017. In 2018, Dakers had her first year-long public art installation, Peaceful Perch, in Harlem's Marcus Garvey Park. And she was also a 2021 AIM Fellow at the Bronx Museum of Art. No, My First Name Ain't Baby is now a promised gift to LACMA, an acquisition initiated by this exhibition. And this is the first work by her to enter our collection. So welcome, Kim. Thank you for joining yes. us. Oh, it's so great to be here. I'm so blessed and so thankful. And it's good to join you virtually. <laughs> it's nice to see you live from New York. Yes, coming to you live from Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into this. Um, I think we have a presentation as well. Yeah. But um, first things first, Kim, can you tell us about your choice of materials? I would say for this portrait specifically, but this is a uh, material that is used throughout your practice. Yes, I genuinely love this material. There are so many um, memories and connections to community that I have, whether it's um, the freedom of being a child and having your, your first bicycle connect you to other children in your neighborhood um, or watch having my dad teach me how to change my own first tire my first car like all the things that go into travel and moving about the world so it's always been a material that attracted me and and going on like um, visits to other cities with my rugby teammates and seeing other people on their journeys and wondering like what's going on with them so the material has always been very like deeply personal to me. It's always something that I can like remember I was on a road or a path somewhere. Um, and it's free, which is helpful, right? Because uh -huh. the material is discarded. And that's a larger metaphor about how we treat uh, Black people across the world um, of using something and then throwing it away. Um, but I, 
appreciated about this work especially is I started to use like motorcycle tires that have like a smoother tread. Mm -hmm. Um, They shine a little bit glossier because they have to acclimate to the speed and then um, incorporating like the gear aspect, the the things that enable the wheel to move forward um, and thinking about all these experiences of blackness, that there are things that enable um, certain te- stereotypes or archetypes about people and especially about black women um, and then discarding them and using them for a specific mm-hmm. purpose. Like we can cont- like right now speak to the Supreme Court hearings mm-hmm. and how uh, the treatment of uh, the incredible Ketanji Brown Jackson like and her composure. So um, in the treatment of this work, I really wanted to uh, make sure that that glossiness, that shine um, shown through, but also to have the markings of the journey be apparent. And I think about the number of times that the incredible Janet Jackson really had to stop and correct people, Mm -hmm. stop and say first, no, listen, my name is, my first name is not baby, it's Janet. And then flip it, it's Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. Uh, (laughs) It's such a reclamation of a moment (laughs) that um, I felt like I had to honor. And I took a careful time to collect certain elements of the hair that you see. Mm -hmm. Um, They, I started to treat it like um, tracks, hair tracks, um, and layering it in the way of a hairstylist so that you can see the flow. So if we can advance to the next slide. Here is the rear view, right? And you can see, that the treads of the tires mirror each other. They're all the same. So I collected this same kind of tire over time. And really thinking about that repetition of defense, the mm-hmm. repetition of defense against misogynoir, right? what we see with the Justin series, again, with Ms. Brown, Mrs. Brown Jackson, and also with the number of times that I can imagine Janet Jackson having to stop and defend herself against sexism and racism and how those layers and that repetition of experience taught her the language. Like throughout the song, she's given instructions. She's Uh like, give me a beat. That's how she first starts it off. And in this moment, she's giving three different instructions. She's saying, no, so stop what you're doing. This is what it is. And then if you want to try me again, (laughs) this is what's going to happen. And that for me, that automaticity, of the delivery from all honor to uh, Jimmy Jazz and um, Terry and the lyricist Jane Harris on the song, but it's for her, it's the delivery and the delivery of her experience is coming through. So when I was cutting through, the collecting and then cutting through, I was thinking about that same layer of repetition of having to go through and the movement that comes with that and how it's a practice, right? She's expressing a practice that she's had to acclimate to because of these forces that she's around. Yeah. I just want to touch on two things. One is that you very specifically said rear view, which to me is very in tune with your use of tires, right? It's almost a play on words, but Mm -hmm. it adds in this case, because I mean, nasty came out of Janet crossing the street, being cat called. And a lot of that, as most women know, comes from behind. Mm -hmm. Right. So this work is very much not um, you have to experience it in full form. The rear view is just as important. It's just as important in recognizing the way the tire adds to the um, the texture of her hair in in the music video. The I I just that that use of language to me was something that I really that I really stuck with. Um, also thinking about the way that tires hold memory and the tread and how they're worn down. And I'm sure that's something that you have to think about when you're sourcing these materials, um, because the texture is so important. And I wonder, do you ever use brand new, um, tires or are they always found and used? The, they're always found in use and even the brand new tires that come my way are ones that were like defects from the factory mm-hmm. that they didn't notice until the ship shipment already arrived. Um, there's something I find really special about just collecting. I have a regular relationship with 
a bike shop in Harlem. Sure. They saved tires for me just to, they're like, oh no, she's doing something, you know, cool with this. And we dig it. Um, and I pop in there every week. Um, and so there's a, something about the randomness that mm -hmm. comes with it um, of the experience and seeing the same um, brand of tire at different stages of wear. And I think about different stages of um, endurance and different stages of what are you able to take in life. For some people, it might be at a job. Um, for some folks, it might be in a love life or with dealing with grief. And that there's some significant event that in that moment of that lifetime of that material, whether in different stages of wearing down, where you can like either hold on to it or take it and make it into something new. Um, and that those, but you know that there's similar experience, a cat call and you know what's going to happen. Exactly. You just, you just take it and then you turn it into something that's funny, right? Then you turn mm -hmm. it into something that's oh, a fun story to engage your friends or family with on your experience to going seeing them. Because th those things happen, those incidents happen on your way to and from. Um, mm -hmm. At home or in places where you feel safe, not necessarily. So I really think about the vehicles that help that facilitate those experiences and the frequency that it happens to certain individuals, especially yeah, and black women. I think um, the material, the way that it collects memories, it's interesting because you're always creating a portrait of usually a very specific idea or person. And you're taking the memories of so many people who may have similar experiences, may have completely different lives um, and connecting them. And there's almost this idea of mystery, but also shared, shared stories. Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, and, and like you've acknowledged that the cat calling is, is so common and it's such a relatable experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why when people see this work, sometimes they're like, oh, I know it's Janet. They, they know right away. Or sometimes they see the, the label and they're like, yes. And that song is so memorable because of the shared experience. It is an uh, incredible honor and compliment to hear the automaticity of mm -hmm. folks like, seeing the work and thinking of it. Um, the video comes out during my birth year, right? So this speaks okay. to the eternal <laughs> aspects of the Janet Jackson, and but also of the song and the album. Um, before she says, no, my first name ain't baby, she says my... Um, Middle name is privacy and my last name is control. And <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Like she's really thinking about the ways that she wants to own how she is being objectified mm -hmm. and to set boundaries around that. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was and still is something that um, I think we all struggle with for sure. Absolutely. Just walking about in this world, just like where is the privacy aspect? Mm -hmm. and uh, how much you allow for control. So um, in many of my works, before I got to this piece, I had felt like it needed to be very contained. It needed to be a bun. It needed to be a ponytail. It needed to have some sort of restrictions. And with this work, um, the how it flows, like I was very, I was very proud of myself for like the patience to cut through each one mm -hmm. and each it's about 48 feet of cutting through tires the long way. Um, I did this work by hand um, and then screwing them as if they were treads or as if they were tracks of hair. 48 um, feet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. But you can um, see the labor intensity in your work. It's, it's one of the first things that I, I noticed. Thank you. Um, yeah. It, um, the emotional landscape that we have to navigate is labor intensive, is invisible labor. Um, and it's not something that can necessarily be mechanized where you can just process it and like be going on with your day. Like it takes on an additional weight. Mm -hmm. And I, um, when I look at the rear view of this piece, it makes me think about the different places of my friends and family and the places they've been the way they've been able to like ingrain their memories to help keep them to move forward and to inspire them as opposed to like having it way down. So this, uh, this is always my, um, my favorite view of this. Mm -hmm. And I was very grateful that uh, the placement um, 
a lot for it to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what is your relationship to Janet Jackson? I mean, there had to be, was there a moment where you were like, I have to do a portrait of Janet? Was it, was it the song that came first? I mean, I'm really curious. Uh, Well, the, I was um, in Los Angeles at the time and I had started to work on this piece. um, I would say two months, just layers of it. Like, and listening to Janet Jackson, right? Just, this is around 2016, where we're seeing the politics of Kamala Harris and the vice presidential debates and Mm -hmm. um, 45 and his foolishness. And, you know, women who are just, it was like Beyonce, Janet, Mary, like folks who really, whose music I find to be so inspirational in all types of, or all aspects of my life, whether I'm in a great mood or wherever I need to be picked up. So um, I went to Los Angeles, I was doing a show and the gallerist, um, Sarah Gavlak, who also did the donated uh, gift to LACMA and I appreciate her for that. Um, she was talking about the next show that she wanted to do. And she's like, I want to call it nasty. It's like, and instantly I was like, Miss Jackson, if you're nasty, <laughs> right? Instantly, and it was top of mind because we had already seen the vice presidential debates and the language that was going on around nasty women. And mm-hmm. I was like, there needs to be a really black piece here in this show and and in, and I up until that point had only if we can go back really quickly um up until that point I had not added the hair pieces the okay. sculpture already had the face it had um it did not have the turtleneck it didn't have the gear but it had the face and I had been just lingering <laughs> on finishing the work so after we had that interaction it was me um, uh, Miss Gavlag and this wonderful artist, Catherine, uh, we were all, we were in a two-person show and we, mm-hmm. I was just like, yes, this is what it should be. Um, so when I got back, it, and I started to think about the patterns that I've been collecting and I've been saving them for like six months <laughs> of collecting the yeah. same tire and knowing that it's going to be useful. Um, and experiencing catcalling in a way and this nasty woman narrative that's around was like, I already know what the hairstyle is going to be. And then it was Janet Jackson there on from September until October, like seven days a week, Janet and making sure the hair and the elements and the turtleneck that she has in the video are all in there and the earring. So I wasn't sure what to do with that, that gear, but I knew the moment that she said that line that that's what it was going to be. So Mm. it was, um, it was a, it it had its very serendipitous like journey, which I appreciate. Absolutely. And I love that you bring up um, working with Catherine conversations with Sarah, what's going on in the world, because it is a reminder, like these things aren't made in an incubator, like work is made through dialogue and conversation Mm -hmm. and it's, it's through relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think Janet had that with Jimmy Jam and the people who were supporting her. And she even said, you know, like I wanted to just call them and have them come like protect me, but I didn't, I went into the studio and their way of supporting me was helping me make this song about Mm -hmm. this moment. And it allowed her to have this sense of agency over the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, you know, has kind of become an anthem for, for all of us today. Oh, it's a top five, top five <laughs> anthem for all of us today. Um, and I, I thought it was very brave of her in her mm-hmm. documentary recently to, to take us through the in the moment at the time footage of her going through the experience of trying to put this album together and asserting herself um, as a woman, as a black woman, as a performer and an entertainer. I thought it was just really brave. So yeah, yeah. very cool. Um, to you, what is and is there a responsibility um, of the artists when it comes to representing a significant figure or their legacy? And I mean, with with Janet, it's more than just nasty, right? She's been through a lot publicly beyond that. So 
I feel like you're also in a way nasty was just a moment. Um, but it, the, it, the reference brings to mind things that followed that happened to her. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it speaks to the, like the cyclical aspects of life that mm-hmm. you, as sometimes we think, oh, as I get older, I will not have to experience this. I will not experience imposter syndrome. I will not experience nope. self-doubt or envy or blah, blah, blah. And it reminds you that there are different iterations of experiences that you're going to have in life. And to see her have this song at a pivotal moment in her life and career, and then almost, what, 20 years later, to be a victim of such a, you know, incredible, on an incredible stage with the Super Bowl. Um, it makes me think about resilience also, because material is very durable. It fights back. It like mm-hmm. me across the face the other day. And it, I find the process to be such an incredible reminder of life. And that like, you just never know when something's gonna slap you in the face. For me in the studio, sometimes it might be a tire that I didn't like pin down correctly or it might be a screw that interrupted the process. And those all feel like very painful, but then like cathartic when you like move past it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, 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 uh, I tip my hat, I tip my hat to Janet for her longevity. And there are a few times where we get to like give someone their flowers, even if we don't know them, like we can do it online. But if in this moment, especially after that experience of being in Los Angeles and that conversation, I was like, there is an aspect of um, Black feminism that needs to be in this, mm-hmm. in this, in this show, especially if that's going to be the title. Right? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, where it was, in a way, you're paying, you know, you're honoring Janet. So I wonder if you felt a certain sense of, of pressure to do it properly and how that weighed on you because I think that kind of goes back to the responsibility like you're really making a statement about more than just her for a lot of people and she's representing that um and that that responsibility can weigh on a person even hearing the question now I'm like (laughs) triggered (laughs) not triggered but like (laughs) definitely feeling like that weight um, if we can advance the slide, um, I think it's two more. So, okay. So um, I really, when I'm looking at a work, I'm thinking about the elements that stuck to me, right? And as I, I watched this over and over again, when I was in the depths of making the hair, and I thought about that earring and that turtleneck and the way that in this, graphic at the time, you can't really, it's not HD, right? But making sure that movement was captured. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to, like, I was inspired by those three things. And I told myself, as long as I stick to those three things and honoring and making this work, I'm good. Because I already had the face. It was really about what are the three things that stuck out to me and honoring and making sure that I'm like paying attention to those details that I'm sure other people are looking at too. Um, and it's the pinnacle moment where she's saying the line. Um, I, fortunately for me in the naming, I have a piece that's already named Janet, um, inspired by my dear friend and Emery <laughs> Janet Kawana Payne Lewis. So I felt that, um, you know, I let myself off the hook by already having a work named Janet. Mm-hmm. And instead, I was able to just hone in on the dialogue because it spoke to a different story. It's not just about honoring Janet. It's also about looking at the moment that she's speaking to where she's standing up for herself and saying, stop, right? This is what I want. She's giving instructions. She's saying, stop. This is how I intend to be treated. And no matter what the situation is, sexual or not. And if we're going to go there, then... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Miss Jackson, you know, uh, Miss Jackson, if you nasty, and even in saying Miss Jackson, she is making sure that she is seen first as like a human being, but also someone to be respected. And it's weird how those like aspects of language, of how you have to have, uh, you know, a doctor or a title or whatever in order to gain respect. And mm-hmm. here, she just simply is like, this is the, this is the 
that's the base manual. We're here talking about baby. We're not doing that. Mm. I'm Janet. No. Yeah. Janet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you talk about the hair a lot, which is obviously such an important piece, but it also brings up this, you know, historic conversation because you're talking about braids and you're talking about updos. And those are ways that black women often make their hair less loud, more acceptable, less, what do they call it? Distracting. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is an ongoing conversation. And this is Janet saying, nope, this is my hair. You know, I'm going to make it as big as possible. And I think that was a really important part of representing her. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was something that was clearly really important to you. I mean, the amount of effort that, that went into getting it just right, the way that it sits, um, the way that that one strand kind of falls over and sits near the nose for me. um, I, I just, the attention to detail, but also it speaks volumes uh, to the moment, to that conversation, to that struggle that a lot of Black women have um, with representing themselves and representing their hair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the politics of respectability around doing that. Um, I really appreciate how you noticed the uh, draping uh, of the hair because mm-hmm. I, I, there's that moment where it flashes across her face and um, without having it being a rotating sculpture, I was like thinking, you know, that's really cool. And there's a freedom of that, um, very different from having a, a you know really tight bun or something braided down. Yeah, and the sculpture, it there's a freedom to the way the hair moves. Actually, you know, when you're installing it, and so I, I just have to say, you know, like when we were installing it, one of the hairs just wasn't where I knew it was supposed to be, and I was like, we have to move that out, you know, because it speaks. To this image and to see it with the the gif the gif whatever we call it um mm-hmm. it's it's very specific um, and knowing like being able to say listen hey girl hair's out of place um i speak to my <laughs> sculptures right hey whoop, we gotta fix that for you um i've spent time in salons and barber shops and also just like seeing women on the street and being like hey you gotta yeah. Did you know your hair? <laughs> just go ahead and fix that. You, we don't even have to say it. You can just, mm-hmm. right? And me with a, a fade, right? I can still do that motion. And it speaks to like the, like those little moments that, and memories that connect us that you know, Absolutely. You, you want someone to like <laughs> yep. point it out. Absolutely. Um, so thinking about the exhibition, does the context of your work in Black American portraits, which I mean goes from circa 1800 to, you know, the last work was finished a few weeks before the show opened, um, does it change the way you see the piece? I mean, this is a very different context from the original exhibition. It was in, from it being in Palm Beach, you know, I think Sarah was like living with it. So that's also another context. And then Mm -hmm. for it to come here and you're, you know, it's you, it's Woody DeOthello, it's Simone Lee, all doing very different things. Um, but there's a very clear dialogue. And then, you know, the, the 2D works, the self-portraits, the portrait yeah. of Patrice Colors, you know, there's, how, how was that for you? Like, how does that, how has that changed how you look at this work? Oh man, you, this, all the feelings of being at the opening came right back. Um, we could jump ahead, I think one or two slides. Oh, uh, actually we can stop, go back one more. Um, uh, so we were talking about the elements, the details that, mm-hmm. uh, that, that I have tried and hold faithful to. And for me, it was like, well, that's not Whitney's real hair, <laughs> right? That is a wig, <laughs> but that's a wig to help make her a little bit more accessible and imagining that she would have to braid it down and keep some aspects of her mm-hmm. there. And those are like, the gold tips. And then, you know, kind of queering up Whitney, Whitney a little bit and, and having kind of like that like nose ring here and just imagining what would it look like for her that she's unapologetically Black, but there are these experiences that have wrapped her in a deep like musical community of mm-hmm. legacy rather. Um, so that, okay, we can jump ahead. Um, I think not that one, but the next one we're talking about 
the other context. works. Yeah, the other context of being in the show. It was um, deeply humbling, um, especially to be there um, at the opening with living legends, the great Betty Sayre, right? Like Samala Lewis, the some, like, right, and, and yeah. then to um, be in with the sculptures and to have Simone Lee on the other side, like um, she did an installation here in New York called Brick House, yep. um, monumental work overlooking uh, at the High Line, overlooking a major corridor in New York City, I found, and representing unapologetically this Black womanhood, and on also honoring Aretha Franklin, right? So there are certain, just to be in the show, one, with Simone Lee, but then also the other artists that represent vessels of being Black, mm -hmm. and, and it just, it meant so much to me to even be, that could have been a show right there, one, two, and three. And I'd be like, it's a oh huge my gosh, conversation. Yeah. Um, and to see the variety of the material also, I thought was really cool. Um, and like I said, deeply humbling because it is 200 years. And um, in some ways, I thought it was very appropriate that the material um, was present because there's so many aspects of the journeys through like portraiture where it's like the method of transportation that it was made at the time was sailing <laughs> mm -hmm. sailing walking on horses and then moving on into this other aspect of um industrialization and then now like on the internet so I materially wise it was I was de deeply humbled to be in such great company of such incredible artists and almost had not almost definitely had the sense of like should I be here are you guys sure like Christine absolutely. But are you absolutely sure um, um that it, was um that was incredible um to us it was important then, to have the different media because you're you're mm -hmm. a you're thinking about what a portrait is you're thinking about what being American is so then you gotta you have to break down all of those levels and think about different media um and like the beauty of the, you know, the evolution of art and what contemporary art is doing is that artists are kind of saying you can make a lot of things into an artwork. You can make a lot of things into a portrait and you have, you know, Rafa Esparza working on these Adobe panels, which are almost these performative pieces, which to me are about a lot more than the object. Mm -hmm. um, you have Woody where you can like very clearly see his hand in a way. Um, and there's this anonymity to this blank face. And I think about um, that, that, you know, common misconception of every black man looks alike. And you, I just, that was my immediate thought. And then Simone kind of removes the, the orifices in a way that makes it so many women at once. And for you, there was a specificity to Janet but then, you know, what we've talked about is that it's very relatable. The experience is relatable. The hair is relatable. Um, the attention to detail in manicuring yourself um, to be presentable is relatable. And I, I would, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and the contextualization of the works on this platform. And then also the placement, because uh, to the a right is Mr. Wash and his mm -hmm. depiction of Kobe. So the inclusion of like uh, celebrity figures who represent more than um, just their profession, more than just their ability Absolutely. to entertain, but their ability to help us feel like we are not alone in the world. And especially in a world that makes us feel like we should be, um, mm -hmm. or that there is no power in oneself. There is no self naming. There's only how people see you. And, um, if we can go ahead to one more slide, the next, okay. So um, if the first image was it like, I, when I first walked in, I was like, oh my gosh, I started to tear up because to be on the platform with those two greats was mind blowing. But then to turn around and see like, oh, there's Kentora Davis, there's Jordan Castile, and in the self-portrait, there's the source of self-regard by one of my favorite oh. books by Toni Morrison. That bookshelf. Oh, like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like it, it 
but it spoke to so much of like how the works are speaking to each other and where the self naming and the idea of self respect comes from mm -hmm. and things that in spite of our experiences as people, as artists, like that there is a self respect, a self determination, a self naming there and to see it expressed in so many different ways in two-dimensional, three-dimensional media. And you also, there's like a video, um, a moving image installation of- um, The Martin Sims. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, like it just, all of it brings together. And then there's like a tenderness and care when like Rafa's work and then in the Clifford Prince- uh, um, Safe space. The safe space, um, Clifford Prince King safe space, like, and the tenderness of Karen doing hair. So mm -hmm. I thought once I like, um, there was a moment I was uh, lingering at the end of the um, second day, I think, and it's myself and Gen Genevieve Gagnard, whose work I was, like simply adore. And it's like, people were dispersing, security guards were like, all right, time to go. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> but if I can just take a moment to just yeah. look and see, um, and that's when I took these pictures and it just helped me like I'm transported back into time and being like, wow, this is like a, such a beautiful conversation that mm -hmm. encompasses all of the things that I was thinking about, attention to care and detail and the need for rest and to be calm and composed and your self naming all while you're moving through the world. Um, just thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you to the curators thank as you. well for bringing together the show because it, it definitely moved me to tears. But thank you for making the work. I mean, it's the the dialogue though, and I and I love this view because I get to see your work looking directly at Clifford's work, which you know, for for anyone that hasn't seen it, is three men kind of in a row, but they're doing each other's hair, and there's like the the gel or the pomade on the floor. There's like the pick. And it's this very intimate moment. And I mean, um, just to go back to hair and the importance of hair for Black people and what a, what a vulnerable state that is to be in to allow someone to touch your hair, um, mm -hmm. to not just to touch it, but to style it um, and to have Janet looking directly at them. It's, <laughs> it's almost like a, I see you, you're seen on both ends. Um, mm -hmm. We're in the same boat, uh, my hair, I, I understand the importance of hair. I understand the way in which it represents me um, and the intimacy that, that it allows. And it's a universal principle that everyone feels mm -hmm. about their hair and about, you know, the, the top three inches of like the crown. Like we just, um, there's still introducing the Federal Crown Act, it already, passed, it already passed. And this idea that you have the agency <laughs> to just go about the world with your hair however you feel and it should not impact your employment your ability to experience civil services in this world like in this nation like it's it, it's ridiculous but it's, it's absurd it's, like we're in 2022 but it's it shows you the longevity of um these enduring thoughts and ideas about the quality of a person mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm getting all <laughs> tense and just, just thinking about it, but really like how these um, subjective evaluations yeah. of human beings, especially Black people um, and the texture of our hair, it, it, um, that it forces us to, um, not forces, it reminds us of how much that tenderness and care is important and the attention to detail and how um, the glamour is an armor also mm -hmm. um, and glossing over those experiences and knowing like I might have had a bad day but I leave the barbershop I'm good leave the salon I'm good absolutely or if I'm I'm at home and I'm about to go to sleep I'm gonna put my bonnet or my scarf on and I'll be okay and mm -hmm. that's the armor that we um that tenderness that that self-love and care for for our crowns is um the armor that helps us when there is a someone saying, "Hey, baby," <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and for for Janet, I feel like she had to take one for the team in a way. She had to experience all of these things so that 
to, to bring attention for all of us who came after her and so publicly um, and that that hair is an armor you know the the beauty the glamour all of it is an armor um, and I just I just think about the weight often that she's had to withstand um, yeah. publicly to draw attention to these things and and that's a very important level of this work um, is bringing up the larger idea more than just the, the singular event or the song, um, but that it's an ongoing problem. That for her, in a lot of ways, it's her career mm -hmm. um, of constantly, and I don't want to ever disrespect that Janet Jackson, but like that's been an anchor for her career. And when Absolutely. you see the difference between how she was treated post this event, um, at the Super Bowl to how um, Justin Timberlake was treated at post mm -hmm. event at the Super Bowl, or how other uh, individuals are able to get away with a certain persona or a certain level of indignation. Like, I could never do wrong, so it must be this individual. Um, the way to pair or hairstyles in general are like something that I really um, find interesting because it's, it speaks to gender in a way um, where I, I like listening to folks talking about the work, but not necessarily knowing that I did it. Um, in some mm -hmm. ways being on this platform, it's like, oh, there's Kim. So <laughs> maybe they might recognize me, but listening to how they would gender the object just because it's black. Interesting. Being like, oh, like, oh, it's got dreadlocks. It's like, that's interesting that you think it's dreadlocks. And it makes me think about the place, the person, the places that person has been prior. Hmm. Um, if we go back, I think two slides to the flat top work, um, yeah, there we go. Boom. This is a, a work called Grace that I made in 2021. And Grace Jones, fellow Jamaican, Jamaican by countrymen, um, her defiance of gender stereotypes through how she styled her hair, how she presented herself in this kind of more aggressive fashion, it made me think about the weight that hair can put on and then also the freedom that not having hair would also do um and walking through the world as a gender non-conforming individual i can get misgender all the time hello sir hi <laughs> nice to see you um but like and that knowing that it's not just me mm -hmm. um, Right. And there are moments where I expect to be misgendered and folks are like, oh, hey, Slim, like, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, man, here I was thought, thinking that I would be kind of uh, incognito or you know, mm -hmm. have an invisibility cloak against those kind of intrusions onto your personality or in intrusions onto your personal and emotional space. And um, thinking of different ways that even when we're walking out, you want to go to the supermarket. Or, and you just don't want to put up with some things, knowing that you have to dress a certain way, um, allegedly, in order to be perceived a yes. certain way. Um, so, um, in the themes of my work, where I'm like toying with different hairstyles, I'm wrestling with material, trying to figure out like, uh, which, which ones are going to match up. Mm -hmm. um, am I going to, if I get two tires of the same? <laughs> the same tread oh man when it's like okay I have to do something it's a sign I have to do something with this because there every now and then you run across an experience that's like reminds you of something else like oh man I just was talking to a friend of mine and they had experienced the same thing like I feel like the material and those experiences with my friends and my community in my life they go hand in hand like three tires of the same tread, all worn out at different points, make me think about friends in different stages of their love lives. Mm -hmm. um, folks who are beginning anew and the tread isn't necessarily worn down yet as much. And then folks who have been in for 10 years and what that must feel like. Um, I went on a bit of a tangent there, but no, uh, okay. for this work, the, uh, um, the flat top I thought was especially um, important to me um, mm -hmm. and how I personally use earrings to help gender myself. So starting okay. with really thinking about, um, so kind of, it, it, I like earrings, but also like knowing I have earrings on, the number of experiences has told me that I'm more likely to not be misgendered if. <laughs> Which I is really interesting because <laughs> that's, that's like a seemingly small thing. And for that to 
have such a great impact on the way that you're perceived, the way that you're interacted with. I mean, it, it says a lot about it says a lot about those people, right? And then you start to think about them um, and, and why they think the way they do. Yeah, because I'm thinking about the number of repetitions that they would have had. Um, but I think a lot of that is informed by my time in schools is that mm -hmm. you, you run into different kinds of people all throughout the community, parents, children, teachers, you know, affiliated services. And every now and then you run across folks who have a similar experience or a similar journey in the school. And you're like, oh, wow, like, <laughs> I've seen, I may have seen this same eighth grader type going through a similar struggle a few times, but for a first year teacher, but that might be their first time seeing that kind of struggle. So they mm -hmm. don't know how to approach it. Um, so there's repetition in different aspects of a life that I think allow you to deal with things that come your way. So you know that you are, I've been catcalled before. I know how to put my earphones in and pretend like I don't hear you. Um, you know, uh, and these sort of uh, defensive woman moves that women have to put in place, women and queer folk and trans folk have to do just to make sure that we get a certain level of respect. So in that way, Jen is definitely a, a icon. Absolutely. And I have just a quick comment before I go to the last question, but um, it's really interesting. And I, I'm thinking about this more because of the moment we're in and because of the SCOTUS hearing, but your works have a certain level of composure right? They're, they're all very composed. And, and there is just this very, very finished. Um, they're not unruly. They're, it's, it's fascinating, because that is something that Black women and women and, and a lot of people in the world feel that they have to have this certain level of composure to be taken seriously. And I feel that same way with the technicality of like working with the material. Like I, I want this to look like there. I want it to reflect all the hard work and attention to detail that I put into it. Mm -hmm. And I think in the Supreme Court hearings, that's what we all want for, um, want for her is for like the questions to reflect the attention and detail that she put into a lifelong career. She's overqualified <laughs> on so many accounts, um, but yet she has to maintain this calmness and composure and, and reading um, some of the reactions online and watching it myself, I'm like, I feel you. Yep. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Like, keep do you're doing a good job. You're doing like, better than I little... would. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> right. But we all, we are all her. We all feel that same, like, man, if they would just stop, right? If Then I, I would be fresh, right? If mm -hmm. there wasn't, if I did not anticipate these glass pieces in the road that are just going to try and make an attempt to get me off course, it, it would be so much easier, right? Great yeah. more hood. You, it could all be so simple, but you'd rather make it hard. And the reasons why, like, the individuals are making it difficult for her are, are um, self-centered um, mm -hmm. to increase uh, political platforms for future campaigns. And it's just a, it's a disgrace. Yeah. Self-interest. Um, yeah, very self-interested. But thinking about people in power and propaganda and representations of wealth and posterity, what do you feel is the function of portraits today? Oh, can we uh, go to the one of Charisse, this one, okay. Um, so uh, this work um, is inspired by one of my favorite people of all time. Um, her name is Charisse Maine, and she uh, is an esteemed educator and leader in East Harlem. She, we, are not, she, we worked together um, when I was a school leader and she, she was someone who really embodied what it meant to be a part of a community mm -hmm. and that the school is not just the lesson plans. It's not just the uh, technical things that folks have to do. It's about all the people in the building. And um, there's a, attention to detail and care and love that she brought to so many aspects of my work day, but the, work, but the days of all the children in the school 
and all the teachers in the school. Um, and she had a characteristic bun of braids that she <laughs> would always um, would wear when it was time to get down to business. It was like, her oh, thing. The yeah. was going up, then that's how you know it's time for us. <laughs> we're gonna we're ready for the day. And um, so when and that wealth of experience, that wealth of joy and passion is immeasurable. And I think some folks forget that like just because you have a lot of money does not mean you are wealthy. You're not well, and this is something I struggle with too, like, and we all do, like, in equating um, the things, the money to things that experiences that we want to have in our life. But um, for me, her wealth and depth of experience, um, I felt was something that needed to be honored. Um, And I made it at a time when I was really looking back on my uh, time in education and all the students and love and joy that they brought to me. Um, Actually, uh, I, before this call, I got a video sent to me of one of my students, former student Savannah, who I had when she was in second grade, and now she is a senior oh in high God. school and been accepted to a dozen colleges, and she, uh, I was her art teacher when she was in second grade, and um, just to see how far she has grown, and in the video, she's got a bun up, <laughs> a braided bun up, and I was like, oh, wow, look at that. In this life, like I know that, um, like Sharice knows the student, I know the mm-hmm. student, and the bud of getting to business. And when I had a longer hair before I cut it all off, like that was one of my favorite hairstyles. I'm gonna get down to business, like, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna make sure I check every box. And um, so when it comes to uh, uh, thinking about like how some people were able to afford to be immortalized and you know we can use the materials that are available to us that you don't care about to immortalize the folks that we see every day and in my mind there you know the Cherise's emotional wealth is the equivalent to you know any millionaire billionaire mm-hmm. it's in the, I, actually exceeds it because it's invaluable I love that you bring up the the student too and the hairstyle because it goes back to the cyclical Right. And it makes you think of this work and you've immortalized an idea um, that I think you yourself have experienced that bun, that getting down to business bun. So this is about more than just Sharice as a person. Um, it's about that idea. You contrast that with the, like I made this work before, I made the Janet piece. So you can see this work mm-hmm. is very self contained from the rear view, all the braids, even in the base. It's, it's the, the strength and the depth and interwoven experiences of um, who it's inspired by, but it's also like all of these things factor in to one. And so uh, I'm very, I'm just, it's one of my yeah. favorite pieces, pieces I'm very uh, proud of it, just, like I'm, uh, just as much as I'm proud of uh, to, to know Sharif. Um, all right. We have seven minutes and two questions. So I think that's perfect. All right. Cool. So one is what tools do you use? So like technically, do you use saws is a, is a question. Yes, I do use saws. So my favorite tools in the studio is a, is a jigsaw. Um, so a jigsaw looks like an, imagine an iron with a blade in, at the, in the middle that goes like up and down and cuts. So that's what I use to disassemble the auto tires, the motorcycle tires and whatnot. Um, it's my favorite, my favorite tool. Like I call her Bertha. So that's like, <laughs> Bertha, where are you? And I'm like, where did I put that at? Where did I put the jigsaw? Love Bertha, that. where are you? Um, um, she carries a heavy load of, you know, disassembling the, the, um, the tires from the sidewall. Um, yeah. That sounds very dangerous like working with, the, I mean, tires are really dense. Yeah, they're really dense. Um, so there are two types of auto tires that I use in my work. There's a motorcycle tire, which I have like woven kind of uh, fabric material inside that hold it together and a um, stronger rim. So I drill a hole in it and able to cut it across. But um, with car tires, they're interwoven with steel inside. So when you cut across, it leaves these like sharp edges like that stick out. Um, so got to make sure I get my, I have my um, tetanus shots up to date <laughs> when I'm working and practicing shop safety um, mm-hmm. because it say I'm trying to affix the tire. It's something that's meant to be round. 
I'm trying to lay it flat in some yeah. ways or cutting across it in ways that expose the necessary but dangerous aspects of holding it together. So um, using a screw to drill it in place is something that like, requires like, full attention. It's like, mm-hmm. phone on, do not disturb. Janet Jackson was playing and <laughs> trying to get this thing to lay. That's so stubborn, just like me, to uh, lay down the way I want it to. It's a very stubborn material <laughs> to yeah. use. Um, the other question is, did the pandemic impact your work? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it did. I'm just curious, and I'm sure they're curious, in what way? Man, I was on a call earlier today where I was asked this very same question. Um, the pandemic did impact my work, I think, on a few like levels. First, I started to feel this like, should I be, you know, running around, jumping in, like digging through trash and picking up tires off the street and like bringing it home because that's where I was working at the time. I was working in my apartment in Harlem and it's already weird enough to be bringing tires in through like an apartment building <laughs> in Harlem but like that was like my regular practice my neighbors yeah. know yeah that's the tires yeah she makes sculptures or whatever they look cool um and so I started to have some that fear of like I have to be at home um and using the tires that I already have um, so it allowed me more time to think about the works that I wanted to make um and the details having time to braid everything, having time to cut through everything um, and to really spend time sorting the different treads mm-hmm. that I get. It's like the different experiences and trying to like put them into buckets. I think that was a, a helpful reflection time for me. I'm like, what am I, am I really trying to, to do this? Like this is a 2020, it's two years ago. Um, I was still not sure if I could do this full time. Um, and you know, where does your work fit in with your passion and the being in the marketplace? Um, but then it also allowed me time, like the Zoom, being able to be on Zoom and being in another artist studio, um, the accessibility of everything, I think mm-hmm. it reassured me that um, what I was doing was like, it's what gave me the most joy was the yeah. highlight of waking up every day and made time fly by so much faster. Um, and then seeing the other artists were doing the same thing. Like, yeah, that was cool. I think yeah, for, so. for everyone, it either made you completely reevaluate what you're doing with your life or it reinforced that what you're doing is what you're supposed to be doing or, or what feels right for you. And it sounds mm-hmm. like for, for you and a lot of artists, it was a reinforcement. Um, but this is, this is how I want to spend my time and and I'm doing this and it's a fruitful practice that gives back. And I think, I think what you do gives back, I I think to you and to everyone that encounters your work. Um, and I'm really, don't have me tearing up on this. I'm really (laughs) so glad, um, to have this, this work in black American portraits um, to have met you and to, to be able to um, put your work in a, a different context than it's been in before. And I, I look forward to everything that you continue to make um, and all of the, the good things ahead. And thank you so, so much for taking the time today to talk with me. Thank you. Thank you, Brienne. It was an honor and a pleasure. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.